Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the last full week of um, content and lectures for the semester. Hopefully, you all can see the light at the end of this tunnel. Um, today, this week, we're going to be looking at different ways that people could uh, try to persuade um, other people to join in a political activism around uh, climate justice and climate change. And we're going to be looking today at some theories of rhetoric. Um, it's going to be a bit more of a theory. Um, section today. Uh, and then on Wednesday and Friday, we're going to look at different way, different ways of framing and articulating our, uh, uh, um, climate justice from both religious and indigenous perspectives. Um, these less, less so for their rhetorical um, appeal, but more just thinking about different ways of framing these questions and the more philosophical framings that we've engaged in uh, this week. And they might have some rhetorical appeal as well. But today we're going to look at the kind of debate over rhetoric and democracy, how it contributes and how it's a detriment to democracy, according to some theorists. And we're also going to think about what rhetoric can what role rhetoric can play in fights for climate justice. So what do we mean when we're talking about rhetoric? Well, usually what we're talking about is some form of speech or discourse that attempts to persuade or motivate the audience. Um, that we're, a, a rhetorical speech is, a, is um, some intention, is intending to have some effect on the audience, right? It's not simply attempting to describe or explain or provide information, but the goal is that the audience should react or respond in some way, that they should change their mind or take some action, uh, agree or disagree, right? That rhetoric is an attempt to persuade or influence or motivate an audience. Um, and usually when we're talking about rhetoric, that this is a question of the manner of the speech, not just the content of the speech. So how you make the speech, how you make your argument, not just what your argument is about. So way back in time, Aristotle, you probably are familiar with this triad of rhetorical appeals. Appeals to ethos, uh, attempt to persuade the audience by appealing to the moral authority or character of the speaker, by assuring the audience that the speaker is trustworthy, that they are credible, that they are, have a, that they are an expert or some other authority on the subject, that they are making this uh, argument in good faith. Appeals to pathos, appeal to the emotions and values and, and, and views of the audience that they attempt to, they focus on, uh, if if ethos focuses on the character of um, the speaker to persuade, pathos focuses on the audience uh, to persuade. And finally, logos, which is the actual logical chain of reasoning. How persuasive is the actual reasoning itself? So you can appeal to the speaker, you can appeal to your audience, or you can appeal to your audience itself. And this is often the way that we think about rhetoric, kind of abstractly. Um, however, rhetoric and political theory, at least since Plato, has been viewed as often dangerous uh, either for democracy or for philosophy and for politics itself. Um, Plato, uh, Plato argued in the Gorgias, as if you read the, the Chambers article, um, that, 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 that rhetoric has democracy is dangerous because of the role of rhetoric in democracy. And for many people, that this is grounded on this idea that rhetoric is about emotional manipulation. It's about how speakers can manipulate the audiences to a to take courses of action they don't have good reasons to do. And this is what we see even in, in our own country with um, the Federalist Papers, number 63, in which Hamilton is discussing the value of having a Senate that meets, um, that has different electoral requirements, that has equal um, different kind of procedures, that um, is uh, re-elected less frequently than the House of Representatives. Um, that he's concerned about to people being blinded by prejudice or corrupted by flattery, that we need some institutions that may be sometimes necessary as a defense to the people against their own temporary errors and delusions. As the cool and deliberate sense of community ought in all governments and actually will in all free governments ultimately prevail, there are particular moments in public affairs when the people stimulated by some irregular passion or some illicit advantage are misled by some artful misrepresentation of interested men may call for measures which they themselves will afterwards be most ready to lament and condemn. Popular liberty might have then escaped the indelible or reproach of decreeing to the same citizens the hemlock on one day and statutes the next. So again, the, 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 the concern that the framers had with the Constitution was uh, of direct democracy being manipulated by rhetoric, that the people could be whipped up into a furious passion um, and abandon their well-reasoned argument. And though, so you needed to have institutional checks to slow things down in, in political decision making in order to allow for reason and deliberation and good judgment. Um, and so many view in the history of political thought from Plato to Tocqueville, um, depending on how you read Tocqueville, um, the democracy is a dangerous form of government because it relies on rhetoric rather than reason. That it relies on these like appeals to emotion rather than appeals to logical decision making. 
But Simone Chambers, in this 2009 piece that I put on Moodle as a supplemental but recommended piece, wants to draw a dis Art wants to rehabilitate rhetoric um, and, and, and reframe the problem of rhetoric. The rhetoric is dangerous not because it appeals to emotions while um, other art forms of argument and speech appeal to reasons. Um, she argues that reason appeals to reasons themselves as a form of rhetoric. It's a rhetorical appeal. change of ideas. Um, and she writes on page 327, rather than truth, the orator seeks to please as many people as possible, but pandering is simply the most common view that rhetoric takes in democracy. The essence of rhetoric on this view is the strategic stance that the speaker takes vis-a-vis -vis his audience, made possible by, by the asymmetry between speaker and audience, but fueled by an interest in power over truth. The rhetoric is dangerous not because of its appeal to emotions and abandonment of reason, but this um, focus on power and manipulation, that it creates a power asymmetry between the speaker and the audience. And this is the form of rhetoric that she describes as plebiscitary um, re rhetoric. And this is rhetoric that is interested in making, uh, securing power rather than trying to figure out what the people actually desire or what the right answer, what the right thing for the political community to do is. That its goal is to, in order to secure that power, to pander to the people rather than try to persuade them or encourage them to actually reflect on their own self-interests. Um, and Chambers argues that there's also no deliberative accountability because it's monological, because it's one way, um, where in a dialogue you can ask people why or how or what evidence do you have for that claim. Um, and you can force people to actually articulate reasons and defend themselves and hold them accountable for their, their rhetorical commitments and, their dis and, and, and the language that they use. Um, the danger between this publicitary rhetoric is that because it's one way, it's uh, someone trying to manipulate a crowd. It doesn't have this deliberative accountability. You can't ask someone why. You can't ask someone in the middle of a campaign speech, right? Uh, why? Or are you sure? Or give me more reasons. And finally, it's this top-down model. It is not about rhetoric in the public sphere in which people try to persuade their friends and their neighbors and their family members about something. This is a form of rhetoric uh, of like Demo uh, of elite leaders trying to pander to the public in order to get reelected, right? But she argues that there is this other form of rhetoric that she calls deliberative rhetoric. And she argue, writes on 336, deliberative rhetoric makes people think. It makes people see things in new ways. It conveys information and knowledge, and it makes people more reflective. Thus, rhetoric is deliberative when it engages in our capacity, when it engages our capacity for practical judgment. Deliberative rhetoric is not simply an eloquent and truthful speaker with all the facts right. Deliberative rhetoric creates a dynamic relationship between the speaker and the hearer. Hearers must be engaged by the speech, got to spark active reasoning and thoughtfulness rather than unreflecting triggers or gut reactions. That, that you can engage in rhetorical appeals, you can appeal to people's emotions and values um, in order to get them to reflect upon their own um, preconceptions, right? Um, so for a, a good example of this deliberative rhetoric is Frederick Douglass's speech, What to a Slave is the Fourth of July, in which he begins this speech in 1850. Um, Three, um, by praising the founda the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers, by praising the rhetoric and the ideology of the Declaration of Independence and the noble sacrifice of the Founding Fathers, um, and to this, like appeal to people's values and emotions, only to then say, however, you people today who are currently profiting from and propping up the slave trade and, and, and slavery in the southern states are betraying that, 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 pro that the promise that was made by the Founding Fathers. And this rhetorical appeal is not attempted to just trigger unreflective or gut reactions, but it's trying to get people to actually reflect on the world and think critically and develop practical reasoning and judgment. So Dreisick, in a 2010 article, John Dreisick, who we've read earlier, um, appeal, this, is, this article is not on Moodle, I can put it there if you're interested in it, um, takes this idea forwards of deliberative rhetoric and argues that there's two different ways that we can think of rhetoric. The one is bonding rhetoric, and this is rhetoric that appeals to shared group ideas, values, or experiences. And the idea here is that you're going to unite a diverse group around a common goal and, and, and expand a sympathetic audience that 
um, or sorry, that you're going, or sorry, that you're going to um, unite your group around this goal, and you're going to energize and build group solidarity. That you're not interested in expanding the size of your group. Uh, you're not interested in reaching out to others. You're reaching out. Uh, you're trying to build this group solidarity. And for many people, this is a bad type of rhetoric because it's divisive. It inflames passions and makes compromise harder. Um, but Dreisick in this article admits. No, later he kind of backtracks this a little bit, that this can be valuable for marginalized groups to organize and gain power, right? Um, and we can see numerous examples, right? This is the kind of rhetoric at work in something like a pride parade, right? That the goal here is 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 to to bond the group together, to unite the group uh, around this common experience, and to build group solidarity. Um, you know, similar similar kind of rhetoric in, uh, in Black Lives Matter, um, and this kind of shows how this is very effective at building group solidarity. Um, but it's also can be divisive and politically confronting, which for Black Lives Matter activists, that's kind of the point. Um, and, but this is why, and but when people critique Black Lives Matter as for being uh, divisive and not being unifying, this is kind of where it's coming from. Um, but bonding rhetoric can also be very dangerous when it's placed in the hands of, uh, uh, of po powerful groups in, in, in an effort to intimidate or, for, or oppress a minority group. Um, so the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia a few years ago is a dangerous form, is a bonding rhetoric. So it's less here um, that bonding rhetoric is good or bad necessarily, but it depends on the kind of relationships of power here. Um, but it does have this danger for being divisive. On the other hand, Dreisick describes what he calls bridging rhetoric, which this is appeals to groups with a different outlook by taking seriously their viewpoint. Um, and the goal here is to unite diverse groups around common goals and creating a sympathetic audience. Um, that they call, you're going to use, and this is what Frederick Douglass was doing, um, this is when people are trying to appeal to other people's values by saying, like, look, you are, um, you, um, by, uh, when environmental activists appeal to, um, to conservatives by focusing on, on economic savings, right, that this is a way, form of bridging rhetoric. Um, but there is danger here that this has the danger of co-option and appropriation, right? You can see um, something like uh, Donald Trump's embrace of the pride flag at one of his rallies when running for president, um, despite, you know, um, pursuing a very anti-LGBTQ equality agenda. Um, but a positive aspect of this is we can look, look to um, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech in which um, he, in which he writes, um, this is quoting from the speech, when the uh, in a sense we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to every American's was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious that today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Right, and we'll talk about this, um, but this is also, this is uh, in a second, the, there's a couple of things going on here. There's this appeal to a kind of broader shared values of the audience, but there's also this use of analogy to expand the audience, this analogy of a, a check, uh, cashing a check in this banker's note, um, that this analogy expands the kind of rhetorical appeal. And, and Dreisick in that article concludes that in general, actors should abjure categorically ugly rhetoric, and bridging rhetoric is preferable to bonding rhetoric. Only when the but we can only kind of know when. Uh, but 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 she, he does a while for when the, uh, contextualizing within the larger deliberative system. Um, bonding rhetoric. So in the case of like an LGBT pride parade as a form of uh, bonding rhetoric or, or Black Lives Matter as a form of bonding rhetoric in order to challenge the systematic exclusion of certain voices from the deliberative sphere. Um, and, and, and what he said, but so, but in general, we should prefer bridging rhetoric to bonding rhetoric in order to kind of promote deliberation and promote um, kind of good democratic values. So I'm putting this uh, a, 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 a uh, YouTube video, and I would play it here normally, but uh, I've gotten reports that they, when I play videos in the in the recorded lectures, that the video's quality deteriorates terribly. So I apologize for that. Uh, so I'm linking this uh, this video from Vox on three different ways of rhetorical appeals about climate change that are non-scientific, uh, including a Tea Party activist, Pope Francis, and uh, a Latinx uh, community organizer that have like these different ways of, of making rhetorical appeals on behalf of climate justice.
So can rhetoric work to persuade people about climate change? What type of rhetorical appeals can be effective? And and this is where Dreisick and Lowe come in, in their 2015 article, where they discuss an experiment where they created conditions for deliberation about climate policy. So they brought a bunch of people together into a deliberative forum um, where, they would en where they would engage in debate and deliberation and conversation and try to come to some sort of consensus about climate policy. And they include people who were concerned about climate change, climate denialists, and those somewhere in between. And so what they found that two of the strongest climate denialists, Mike and Nancy, who they anonymize as Mike and Nancy, that both before and after deliberation, Mike and Nancy did not accept the science of climate change. However, before deliberation, they categorically rejected proposals for emissions trading and carbon taxation. They saw no need for carbon pricing and were not willing to pay anything for emissions mitigation. At the end of the process, their skepticism and rejection of the science remained, but they were both willing to regard compulsory financial contributions uh, to measures that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions as legitimate policy options. So in these, we can engage in deliberation and try and acts of persuasion with people who are climate skeptics, and they will still remain skeptical of the underlying science. But what is possible, according to Dreisick and Moe, based on this one experiment, is that you can persuade them to accept climate policy as legitimate. So even if you don't persuade them about their underlying values, that you can persuade them about accept the acceptability of certain policy options. So the question is how? Well, this seems like a paradox. If they haven't actually changed anything about their stance on climate change, but they are willing to accept climate policy. And, and Dreisick and Lowe argue through their kind of analysis of the transcripts of this deliberative experiment, there's two key rhetorical devices um, that facilitate bridging rhetoric. The first is connected is the role of analogies, which are on which they connect these to similar things uh, to persuade people about the legitimacy of certain actions by accepting the legitimacy of other actions. And here they uh, the idea uh, in in the discussion of the Medicare for climate, right? That that everyone accepted in Australia, um, this is where this took place. Um, the legitimacy and acceptability and value of the Medicare tax um, that provides for the universal health care program in Australia. And so they were able, when, when using this analogy that like even if you disagreed with universal health care, even if you had um, that, that everyone kind of accepted this program as legitimate. And by analogy, they were, uh, um, the people in this forum were able to persuade Mike and Nancy to accept, well, OK, if I have to pay taxes that will go for a climate emissions mitigation efforts, that that would be legitimate, even if I do not agree with it, right? That they're not necessarily persuading them about the importance of mitigating greenhouse gases for the sake of climate change, but they are persuading them that this is a legitimate and acceptable policy option. So you're expanding the range of what they find acceptable. The second rhetorical device that Dreisick and Lowe focus on is framing. And you probably have studied this um, in other classes, but framing effects, and this is like emphasizing and contextualization, contextualizing information in a particular way to affect how the information is interpreted and valued. That when you frame something, you highlight certain aspects of the information and, can, and, and provide a narrative backstory for it by, uh, that is going to affect how someone interprets and values and uh, renders that information as meaningful. And so the framing around trust in government, um, that the government and institutions are trustworthy and going to be more trustworthy than private institutions and that like, we can trust the government, provided an effective framing way for people to accept the legitimacy of this climate finance pro financing program, uh, even if they don't actually care about climate change. Um, and so here they were able to achieve this effective policy option. Um, not by changing people's mind about the need to fight climate change, but by framing the policy responses in ways that were acceptable and legitimate. And so here, the goal is to focus on persuading someone about the legitimacy of certain policy actions, like a cap nationwide cap and trade effort, or uh, financing sustainable energy, or retrofitting buildings, or these other pol concrete policy goals, which um, various public opinion polls have actually found have widespread majority approval ratings throughout the country, things like funding renewable energy, things uh, like taxing polluting uh, greenhouse gas pollution at the corporate level, things like retrofitting buildings to make things more energy efficient, that you focus on these policy actions, not the underlying beliefs about climate change. Um, and, and Dreisig and Lowe conclude that the particular kind of rhetoric that should be sought is bridging in character, that it can reach those who do not share the speaker's perspective. Bonding rhetoric appealing to one's only one side is likely to entrench division. The limitations of climate change communicators such as Al Gore can be understood in this light. 
Bridging rhetoric uh, can be in short supply in adversarial political systems such as Australia, which may be one reason why such systems, including the United States and Canada, have had more trouble in processing environmental issues and climate change than in more consensual democracies such as those in Northern Europe. But it's precisely why effective rhetoric is much more necessary in an adversarial system. Historically great rhetoricians such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela are known for their effective bridging rhetoric in situations of deep division, not in situations of consensus. In this light, what we need is not just Medicare for the climate, but Mandela or multiple Mandelas for the climate. So I want you to think about this uh, in your discussion threads on the kind of role of uh, rhetoric and different forms of rhetorical appeals. But I also want you to think about, and especially as we turn uh, to different kind of ways of framing climate justice in non-philosophical language, how, what, in what cases bonding rhetoric might be more valuable than bridging rhetoric, or if there are such cases. What are they? So on Wednesday, we're going to look at some religious uh, writings, looking at both Pope Francis's writings on climate change, as well as the Islamic Foundation for Ecology and Environmental Sciences uh, Declaration on Global Climate Change, um, to get both a Christian and an Islamic perspective on climate justice. How do these religious framings differ from the one other framings that we've already studied uh, this semester, as well as um, how these might provide effective rhetorical appeals. For the discussion thread, I want you to consider someone or some group that is opposed to greenhouse gas mitigation policies. Uh, describe one analogy and one framing device that might be an effective rhetorical bridge to that person or group. Uh, so how could you bridge the divide between someone who is categorically opposed to fighting climate change? And as your friendly reminder, the, uh, gen the hope and expectation is that these 200 word posts are submitted by Friday at midnight and then you submit 100 word replies by Sunday at midnight. So that is going to wrap it up for today's uh, mini lecture on rhetoric and climate change. Hopefully this was uh, useful and valuable for you. If you have any questions about the material or any concerns about the class, feel free to email me or drop into office hours and we can uh, work from there. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Stay healthy and I'll see you next time.